Hello, everybody. My name is Shiva agarwal -Yans. I'm a publisher at Elsevier. I would like to welcome you to this, this webinar that is hosted by the journal Progress in Neurobiology. The, the webinar is entitled Open Spin Microscopy and Functional Imaging in Zebrafish Through Light Sheet Microscopy. This webinar is part of the When Size Matters series of webinars from Bitplane. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors very much at Bitplane for making this event possible. It is my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's speakers, Dr. Emilia Walda and Kevin Frischman. Dr. Walda is the microscopy developer at IGC, that is the Institut Gobekken de Ciencia in Oberish in Portugal. Currently, he is developing such programs as an open source light sheet microscope, a super res resolution microscope called D-Storm, and an invented, uh, I'm sorry, an inverted two photon second harmonic microscope with FCS FLIM capabilities. Kevin Frischman is a senior application scientist at Bitplan, whose application support team he joined in 2003. Prior to Bitplane, he began his career in microscopy as, S as the SEM lab instructor in 1998 at Montclair State University and continued in this field as the manager of microscopy and the imaging facility at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. This is where he first started with 3D imaging in the forms of confocal microscopy, micro-CT, laser surface scanning, and the IMARIS program. Before we begin, let me remind the audience that we will have a questions and answers session following the presentations. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the Ask a Question button on the right-hand screen of your corner. Um, I would like to encourage you to input questions as and when you think of them. This will be addressed in the Q&A session in the end. Um, I would like to remind you, the more questions asked, the better the session would be. And without further hesitation, I would like to hand over to Dr. Walda to begin the presentation. Thank you very much to everybody, and welcome to this webinar. I'm really pleased to show you some of the work I've been doing during the last two years here at IGC. <clears throat> so, uh, just to sorry, uh, just to make another look of the presentation, I will talk about two different things. At the beginning, I will focus more in the Open Spin Microscopy project that it was based on the development on of an open source, uh, only not only software, but also hardware for light sheet microscopy, and all the experience and that we gain with this with this project, and trying to show you how easy it is to build these kind of setups, and encourage you to to work on this field. And in the second part, I will talk. I will focus more on a different project that I'm carrying on with the collaboration with another institution here in Portugal, the Fundação de Sampalimão that is more related with functional imaging in Zebrafish. So first of all, I would like to thank to the people from Bitplane and Ender to invite me to this, this webinar, and Elsevier for the support and, and the sponsor of this talk. So just as an introduction, uh, I'm working in the Instituto of Bank and Ciencia, that is located here in Oeda, it's really near Lisbon. And integrating this campus, there are several institutes that uh, all of them, they share some of the facilities that they are based on, on our building. And the main one is the, the imaging facility where I belong, and it's made by Nuno Moreno and Gabriel G. Martins, I guess, uh, the, the chief of the facility nowadays, and Nuno Pimpaon, uh, Ania Gonzalez and Jana Nieder. And we are all, the main objective of our facility is basically the maintenance of the equipment and organization of microscopy courses, like the EMBO course we were handling here last week, and giving assistance and training to all the, the people in the, in the institute and other institutes around us. And we have a huge bench of microscopes available for all the people, mainly confocals, spin, and the convolution microscopes, and also a multi-photo microscope. So only in the, in the last years we started to develop, to have a developing area inside the institute, and we were awarded with one of the grants from the Fundação de Ciência e Tecnologia from here, from uh, Portugal, and for a project called uh, Imaging Structures and Dynamics of Molecules in Living Organisms. So in that project, the main idea is to construct a super resolution microscope at this storm and uh, FCS. And more or less, the this storm is already finished, and we are just finishing the, the construction of the FCS. So 
just this to show you that we are also doing development during the the last days. But in this talk, I will focus more in the light sheet microscope and some of the drawbacks and advantages that this kind of microscopy shows and the opportunities that open for many labs to construct their own microscope. So just briefly, I will just comment what is the difference between fluorescent microscopy, normal fluorescent microscopy, and light sheet uh, fluorescent microscopy. In a normal microscope, well, not normal, uh, traditional microscope, you have that the, uh, the objective, the <clears throat> the illumination of the sample is made in the same axis than the collection. So you can either have an inverted microscope or um, or um, an upright microscope, but you always will illuminate your sample in one direction and collect all the photons that the fluorescence emit in the same direction. Opposite to that concept is the uh, fluorescent light in microscopy, where the light will come in a perpendicular axis of the detection objective. And this presents some of the advantages I will show in a, in a while. So basically, um, only uh, the plane under analysis will be illuminated. That uh, this is not the case in confocal microscopy, for example, where all the, the axis of illumination, even if we are only catching images from one single plane, uh, we will acquire, uh, we will uh, illuminate the sample above and under. So that induces uh, high levels of photo damage and photo bleaching on the sample and diminishes the, the, the time that we can exposure our sample to, uh, to imaging. On the other hand, in light sheet microscopy, because this only illuminated one plane and the one that we are analyzing, this allows long term imaging experiments, but uh, embryo development experiments. So, okay, as I was saying, the whole plane is acquired at once with the CMOS camera. So that allows us to fat acquisition rates and a big uh, field of view. So bigger samples are able to be imaged during a long period of time. And also it uh, allows us to track fast average, as I will show you in the second part of our presentation related with functional imaging. Moreover, uh, light sheet microscope presents one of the features that none of the traditional microscopy provides, but it's the ability to rotate the samples. So you can uh, observe the samples from really different point of views that before probably were hidden, and this gives a really nice uh, capability to, to this kind of imaging. And on the other hand, it's compared with other microscopes, could be really cheap and really easy to build. So. This is the main purpose of our system. Um, until now, as you can see, uh, it was mainly used for developmental biology. This here I will just show you an example of one of the movies we acquired last week during the NEMBO course we are organizing. This was a movie acquired during, during uh, 30 hours of imaging. And you can see that you can track really in a nice way a lot of events that occur in the sample. and keep imaging without losing or creating photo bleaching into the sample. Uh, I would like to thank to Stephanie Hirk for this sample that she, she provided us, and it's a really, really nice example of the, uh, how this technique can be used for developmental biology. So, uh, in the, the transparency I, in this slide, I would like to show you how this system works. So, Basically, the way that you mount the sample is embedded in a tube of agarose, so the samples are freely mounted in this, in, in this uh, way. And you can also, as I will explain later, add some bits in the, in the agarose, so they will allow you to have the reconstruction of the sample. So when, once you have the, your sample mounted, the only thing you have to do is move your sample through the light sheet. In that video, you can observe that we created a light sheet, in that case by scanning a mirror, and then the sample is moved across the, the, the sample. And, okay, the video stopped, but, okay, the sample is moving across the, the sample and you are recording for every plane the information regarding your sample. And after all, you can process it to create a maximum projection, 3D volume reconstructions, or every data analysis that you are interested to do. So we'll pass to the next one. Uh, 
psychology before, in epifluorescence, the same objective can be used to excite the sample and to collect the reflected illumination, uh, fluorescent illumination, or uh, in transmission. In light sheet, we have the couple angles. So now the axial resolution, the X-ray resolution, will be only be determined by the objective of detection. And in the side of the illumination, we can create the light sheet in two ways. The simple one and the first reported it was using a cylindrical lenses, and it was called selected plane illumination microscopy or STEAM. That is probably the, the the name that everybody is more new in the community. But there is alternative ways to create the the light sheet, like the uh, moving a, a galvo mirror and creating. A, a plane of illumination, but only with a single line moving really fast. And this is called digital scan lysine microscopy. And has many advantages, as I will explain later. As you can see here, these samples uh, have a problem. We are illuminating from this side, the light is coming from this side. So when you have opaque samples, you will have obscured the second part of your sample. A way to avoid that is the, the function I told you before, is the fusion of, of the different views. So you can rotate your sample, acquire sequentially different sets of view, and at the end, applying some algorithms to create the fusion. So in that case, you can see here one of the fused uh, ants that I was acquiring. All this is out of fluorescent, and what I was doing is just acquiring with these three different channels and then fuse all the channels and all the views to create this fantastic 3D reconstruction. So now we'll talk about a bit about the, the problems that light sheet creates. The sample is not only obscure in the part far from the laser, but also you have some other artifacts. Uh, here, uh, I'll show you one 3D acquisition we did. I don't know if you can uh, see, but there are some stripes appearing in the sample. This is due to absorption in, in the first layers of the sample that create these kind of stripes. And they are sometimes really annoying, and when you want to do a, a 3D volume reconstruction, you need to get rid of them. So there are different alternatives. The first one is just, uh, just with another Galvo mirror uh, used as a pivoting system. So what you can uh, you achieve with that is just to average. You illuminate your sample with different angles, and you make an average of the different angles. There are other techniques, like the one provided by Corinne Lorenzo, that is the operational stationary noise removal software that appears like a plugin that you can find easily in, in Fiji. It's really nice, it works. The only problem is that it's a bit slow, and if you have a huge amount of data, it's really difficult to, to process all this to remove your stripes. Another solution is with double side illumination, that you can illuminate either from one side and then alternative from the other side, and try to combine the two, view, two views in order to uh, average these stripes and get rid of them. And other systems, they also, apart from the double side, they use two cameras, or the one solution we are using in our case is rotating the sample and then fusing. So you are getting rid, when you fuse all the images, you are uh, getting uh, rid of these problems. So. so in that case, what we are doing is using another plugin that you can find in, in Fiji, is the stream registration plugin, and developed by Stefan Privich. And basically what you have to do is add in some uh, fluorescent bits on your on the agarose where you're having your sample embedded and then recording multiple uh, views. In that case, we recorded eight different views and with the software, you're able to detect the position of the bits as a reference point and then the software itself is able to, to make the matching of the correspondence of the bits and create it at, at, uh, a view that is a fusion of the different views. And recently, he developed also some software that using the bits, you can measure your point spread function and make the deconvolution of your, your sample. This software is working really nice. The only thing, sometimes you need a strong computer to be able to, to compute for all the, the data. Here you can see uh, the fused view from the, the, the previous sample I was showing you with all the stripes and all the problems. But after all, you can get really nice 3D volume reconstructions. 
Okay, here are some more examples that I took from really opaque samples, ants, uh, spiders, and Drosophila embryos. In that case, I don't show the videos, it uh, will be too late. So let me just go now with the open software and hardware solution. So basically, because we are a facility, we are trying all the time to save costs, and open software is a good way to do it. We have a lot of customers and a lot of equipment, and it's not only saving time, but uh, money, but it's also saving time because you standardize the training. Once you have someone training to use one software, it's able to sweep on, on different softwares that we have in, the, on, in our institution. And for image processing, the same. Although uh, Imaris is really nice software, we are also using for basic software processing uh, ImageJ and Fiji and other softwares like IC. And for control, you can also control the microscopes uh, with a micromanager, that is our favorite one in the institution. And it's really good one for camera-based systems. So we have a screening microscope, a spinning disk microscope, the disk storm, and our spin. It's controlled by micromanager. So when you are trained with this software, it's able to go to any other one. And if you have other systems that they are more based on laser scanning, you can use ScanImage, although in our case we are not using it so often. So we are also creating different tools, like the agenda that is for scheduling or the circle, that it's able to monitor different devices on the institution, and all based in free software and free hardware. Uh, so we are, the software was developed at California, University of California, and it works with almost all devices that you can connect to, to um, a microscope. So just to show you, it has different levels, but it's mainly the, the, the one part is growth in, in Java, and other part is in C, that is the core, and every, every device has a, what is called device adapter that is made in, in C. So in case that you're one of the devices you want to connect to the system, you can just create your uh, device adapter really easily, and we did for several of them, just following the, the, the instructions you can find in the web page of Micromanager. So don't be scared to, to work with this kind of software because it's really easy. You can go from low complexity things, just creating low level, uh, low level Java scripts, or to start working with the interference and creating your plugins, or if you want to get something more, just add, make your own software using the, the, the available tools that they give you. So, uh, on the hardware side, we discovered really this uh, Arduino board that is amazing. It's just a board that it cost uh, around 20 euros, really flexible, and where you can do whatever you want. We have using it intensively in our institution. It's really cheap and, and easy to, to operate. I encourage you to visit the, this web page and YouTube, where you can see the creator of this, uh, this device, this microcontroller, Massimo Banzi, that will guide you in many, many different approaches and things that you can do. It's, there are crazy projects running out of this uh, simple board. And everything you want, you can just customize and do it. In making your own uh, drum running or assistant to watering your, your your plants. In our institution, we are selling for several for several things. And <laughs> one of them is uh, just for shutters of the microscope, just to monitoring the power levels. So you can do whatever you want. Um, yes, I will give you some examples that we use in our microscope. So all this experience, uh, we created uh, the OpenSpeed Microscopy Project that is basically a web page where you can find all the information to build your own uh, spin microscope. And the software, plugins, and not only uh, spin microscope, but also optical projection tomography, that is uh, Gabby, my collaborator, that develops on this work. And all this, you can find information in a Nature Method correspondence that was published last year. So basically, the system we created is uh, using an argon laser with three lines, 488, 567, 648 nanometers. We have a double mirror to create the DSLN mode and a camera, flash 4, and different detection objectives. And 
basically what we are doing just to scan your sample is moving uh, as you before uh, through the light sheet using a DC linear motor stage. And for sample rotation, we use a stepper motor that we drive it with a simple board that you can buy also for the Arduino boards only for 20 euros and some add-on add uh, boards that I will show you in a while that also are really cheap and really easy to connect. So with this, we have achieved probably the, what is one of the lowest price microscopes in the market for light sheet microscopy. Quite flexible, running in different uh, modes and really easy to use. So if you have any question or any you want more information, I encourage you to visit our webpage where you can find all the information, all the parts and all the secrets to build your own steam. So most of the times this is how it looks like. When I have people visiting me, they tell me, this is really a microscope? Yes, it is. So it's made uh, of different parts we have in the institute and other that we bought. but. Uh, basically, it's common pieces that you can find everywhere, and laser, cameras, motors, objectives, lenses, and at the end, if you see commercial systems, it's similar. The only thing we just need to uh, include a box around, but the, the, the way it's working inside is exactly the same. So here you have a scheme, how the system works, we have just different lasers that we can combine, and basically you have in lighting microscopy, one illumination arm and one detection arm. So uh, in our case, we have well, everything is controlled by Arduino, as I was telling before. Here you have a scheme of the illumination arm, and basically we have shutters that is really easy to control with Arduino, just connecting to one of the pins, and you have here the shutter control. And just at this point, I would like just small brief comment on the some aspect you need to take into account, because you need to. Uh, conjugate what, as I was saying before, oh, sorry. the light sheet, uh, the, the pivoting point of the galvo mirror with the objective lens, we created uh, two different magnifications, just keeping the distance between them of 225, so you can have different magnifications on your system. And this is the basic scheme. You just need to fulfill the 4F rule, uh, distance from the galvo to the mirror F1, and this is some of the two focus lens and this to the buff focal aperture of the your objective. So one of the limitations of light sheet microscopy is like as you try to create an homogene uh, plane of illumination, it's not always happening as you wish because the light is following the relic and, and it's focusing and then uh, diverging again. So at the end you have only one small area that is the, your effective area of illumination. So depending on the magnification you give to, to your beam, you will can play with this. So you have to need to give, uh, achieve a trade-off between the resolution, uh, axial resolution, is the, the thickness of your beam, and your uh, field of view. So in our case, we just characterize our system, and you can have using the 4x magnification, an uh, axial resolution of 3.7 or using the 3.5 or 6.6. .6. But in that case, uh, you will reduce so much your field of view that for some experiments, this is not, um, it's not acceptable. So most of the times we are working in, with this setup. This is just something to take into account when you construct your, your light sheet. In the vessel um, configuration, what we are doing is just stirring the beam, uh, moving the beam really fast up and down, so the, we create in this position the light sheet. The advantage of this technique is that the, the overall um, phototoxicity is reduced and that you make a better profit of your laser because you concentrate all the line in, in one position. You reduce the photo bleaching, and the more important that you can create, uh, you can use, for example, two photon light sheet microscopy, use different type of uh, beams like vessel beams illumination, or even modulate your intensity to uh, make a structure illumination and get rid of some background uh, out of fluorescence. So for the Galvo control, in the web page, you can find the circuits that you need to build just to add on to your uh, Arduino board. 
And with this, we have really good results, and in a really cheap way. Then in the detection arm, we have different set of objectives, and we can get from really big field of views to uh, really high resolution, depending on the sample we want to analyze. This is how the plugin we built it uh, looks like. So here you have the way where you control your stage, the, the positioning. If you want to make a uh, start, you just need to select the first position and position and the step size. You can do uh, time-lapse images, and you can control the position of your sample and then during the acquisition also rotate it. Here you can select between the spin mode and OPT mode, and also you can have multi-color imaging. So here you can select your uh, different filters, and here configure during acquisition. The way to configure your filters for the software to read is just editing this text file. Yes, it's really easy. You just need to name the files and see how you want to this part read it. If you have any questions later on, I will be pleased to, to inform you. Yes, for the rotation, we are using different shields that you can buy in Adafruit or in Sparfang, and they are really easy. Just uh, connect them to the Arduino board, and with this one, you can get 200 steps, or this one that it's uh, doing micro-stepping, you can get even 1,600 steps. Uh, so using the Sparfang uh, Arduino shield, you can get really nice micro-step, but it's ideal for OPT, as I was saying. And this is the, the scheme you have to follow to, for connections. Okay, we also bo uh, built our uh, different uh, filter wheels. So a commercial one will cost 1,000 euros for just yeah, 200. You can have your own made one. So as you can see, with Arduino, it's really flexible, and you can do many things. So I encourage you to see the presentation that my colleague made the last week or two weeks ago about optical precision tomography, where you can see all the details, because our system is also able to use the same software and the same system to create optical projection tomography. And this job has been awarded with the Nikon Small World Competition first prize in video. So I encourage you to, to see all this information. And another thing you need to take into account when you mount your system is that this is the, probably the, the more creative part of the, of the job is how to mount your sample. We have developed different ways to attach uh, different attachments for the objective, for water detection objectives other for air objectives, and this was uh, one with a heating system. So this you can find all the information in our YouTube file, so you can find how to build your uh, sample or how to mount your sample. So just visit this, and you will have all the information you need to make your own. But this is, as I told you, every time we meet with other people of the spin wall, the lighting world, we are sharing all secrets on how to mount your sample because this is something has never been done before and you need to create new ways to, to mount your sample. So. And okay, just to finish this part, I will just show you some of the applications I'm taking care uh, now with, in, in our institution. This is one of the nice jobs I'm doing is using the spin to image 3D cell culture. This is basically cell aggregates in three dimensional and we are also using in uh, basically uh, neurospheres. There are thousands of neurons and other cells making these uh, structures. And we are able not only to, to see them uh, in one side, but also rotate it and make 3D reconstructions. So with this, we can uh, get more inside the, the samples because they are highly scattered. But by mixing the view from different samples, only the, the real, real core is opaque for us. And we are able to reconstruct uh, 3D networks inside the sample and also make lifetime experiments uh, where we can see the cell death uh, when we expose the samples to different drugs. And this job is going to be published soon in Frontiers in Cellular Neuroscience. Also, we are collaborating with people that are several fish wall, and this is one of the, the experience we are starting now, that there are these several fish that they are injected with uh, tumors, and we want to see how the tumor spreads all over the, the body. 
and uh, this was uh, during the Nembo course uh, two years ago. We also were able to to see the the migration of the glia cells in the colonization of the several fish embryo. This is a nice video, but okay, I will show you another time. And collaboration with Francesca Perry. I also use it for imaging different types of animals that I <laughs> gather everywhere, and I ask everyone to to give me samples like uh, ants. Daphnia, uh, Acari, or even uh, mosquitoes from malaria. Now the thing is with the butterfly wings, because they are different, really difficult to mount in confocal microscopy, we found a way to mount it in our system, and we were interested in see how the eye spots creation, uh, what is the process of, of the eye spots creation. And also we are collaborating with people using uh, fatty tissue, and we are able to reconstruct 3D, uh, really nicely, 3D volumes uh, of uh, ganglia, that is the uh, fluor 4 in the neurons, and we were able to track, the videos are not available, but uh, I can show you another time, uh, tracking the, the, the dynamics of calcium in steroids or inside the ganglion uh, Ganglion cells. This over, you can get really nice cementations of your sample. I apologize that the videos are not available, but this application didn't uh, allow. But they are really nice, and afterwards, Kevin will show you some of the capabilities of MRIs to analyze 3D volumes acquired with light sheet microscopy. So, okay, this was the, the, the end of the first part, and now I want to talk to you about a different history. It's like the functional imaging in Sebrafis, and this is a collaboration I'm taking part with the Fundación Champalimó and the Instituto de Gulbenkian de Ciencia, and it's founded by the Fundación de Ciencia y Tecnología de Portugal. And basically it's the, with the Michael Orger in Michael Orger's lab in, in Champalimó, we are building a system being able to track the activity of several fish uh, and create a stimulus and see how the sample reacts to this. So as the brain is the final frontier, like uh, Star Trek says, but we are going to try to do the neural track. It's like traveling inside the brain of the of the several fish in order to build uh, how it's working. So the brain is made of thousands of billions of interconnected neurons as many as stars, uh, and now during the last years it's taking a lot of attention and there are several projects, one from the European Union and from the American uh, US Department of Health, uh, in order to discover how the brain is working. So the final goal is to, 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 is to realize how the, the brain works as a whole, not only single neurons or um, separate tissue, but uh, all as a system. So basically the, 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 the brain is formed of different neurons interconnected that responds to stimuli creating a behavior. So if we are able to record all the brain activity, we will be able to, to, to see how the different parts of the brain are interconnected and react to, to certain stimuli to create behavior. No? Uh, LightSheet has opened the door to this new kind of research because they are able to image a uh, thousand of neurons simultaneously, as you will see. Several uh, fish uh, is probably one of the best organisms to see. If you see here, you have different types of organisms and see the, how the complexity is growing, the, the number of, of neurons that you can need to study. And probably several fish is on the level that it has enough complexity and differentiation in different parts of the, um, of the brain as humans, but with uh, much less uh, quantity of neurons to be analyzed. No? On the other hand, for microscopy, it's really interesting because in early ages, like the embryos, it's really transparent, and also you have really varieties like the Casper one that they are even more transparent, as you can see in the early development stages, that it's really transparent, so it's ideal for light scene microscopy. So many things have been known until now about the morphological, but now we want to go more into the behavioral part. No? And several uh, fish is really interesting because it has a stereotypical behavior and is responding to different uh, huge uh, branches of uh, different uh, stimuli. 
not only visual, that is the one that we are mainly interested, but also olfactory, gustative, auditive, or hydromechanical. And it's able to sense his environment in, with all these uh, different senses. So just to show you one of the pictures, this is the, here you can see the uh, two photon microscope that they were using uh, until now. And basically what you are doing is just projecting from down some stimuli, basically are some patterns like this one or this one. And you can see how the, the, the animal is reacting. In that case, in the video, I don't know if you are able to see it. Sorry, it's too small. We are just projecting uh, rotating light and the animal is able to have the feeling that it's advancing. And you can see how the eyes are tracking, the, are moving up and down as the, the, the light moves. So he has the feeling that it's advancing. In the other video that I was not able to convert, <laughs> sorry, uh, you could see these are free moving fish. So when you change the orientation of the pattern of the light, the fish is just sweeping uh, to different directions. So this is the thing we are using to create the stimuli into our fish. In confocal, this is the axis of illumination. You illuminate all your sample, uh, although you are only interested in recording this small volume. Another alternative is using two photon microscopes, so you will, 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 will only get information from this point, but you need to move this point all over your sample, so that takes a lot of time in order to record a single plane. And one advantage is that you use infrared light so you have better penetration. On the other hand, in light sheet, because we are illuminating this whole plane at the same time, we are able to acquire thousands of neurons simultaneously. So here is a typical image that you can obtain from a light sheet microscope. So this is just a snapshot that takes about 20 milliseconds to be acquired. And in that picture, you already have 5,000 neurons. In that case, we are using a six-day embryo uh, with GCAM3 that express uh, the calcium in all the neurons of the body. So with light sheet microscopy, we are able to obtain uh, simultaneous uh, recording at video rate acquisitions uh, of a huge amount of number of neurons. So before, uh, Light sheet microscopy, it's evolving from the first two lenses to uh, adding a second illumination path or two illumination paths and two detection arms. So that makes the system much faster in, a, in order to have uh, multi-view reconstruction. And on the other hand, the evolution of the system just to go from slow acquisition rates to medium and really fast ones. So I will just briefly make a review of the different systems that are available on the systems on the market. Uh, the first one is the one I showed you before. It's just you have your sample, uh, your light sheet steady, and your detection lens steady. And what you do is moving your sample through the light sheet. No? This is ideal because uh, it's really cheap. Well, it's not ideal. It's just good for many applications. And mainly if there is a slow processes, it's okay, and it's cheap, easy to mount, and uh, effective. But if you want to make behavior analysis, for example, you don't want your sample to be moved. And if the process you, are going, you want to track is really fast, also it's not really ideal. So also you can move, try to move it faster using piezo motors, and this has been already used for uh, uh, functional imaging. But basically, they concentrate in one single plane, just select some neurons, and you can track the analysis. And if you want to do 3D, the maximum they achieve using piezo motor is five planes, every eight microns at four edge. So it's good, but it's not really fast. One way to uh, overcome this is making interleaving acquisition. So the motor is moving in different positions, and you can get all these five planes but really slowly. Uh, the evolution, and one of the nice things, came with the possibility not to move the sample, but to move the light sheet and coordinate the movement with the detection objective. So, so uh, you just need to refocus your detection objective with uh, the light sheet move with the galvo mirror. This has been used in different systems, like the OCPI system, 
that in that case it was the first version that what they did it was to directly attach the the the, uh, the illumination to the objective so in that case will be always on focus and it has been used also to track images of uh, of neurons in, in that case in mouses and they were able to uh, acquire the entire stack in between two seconds and with five mic uh, micro separation. Uh, so they acquired 20 planes per second. So the thing started to become a bit better. There is another system now available commercially that is the die spin that it's able to acquire 200 images per second. The only problem of this system is that you don't have rotation. And the other one that because it's using high numerical and high magnification objectives, it's mainly intended to sample that they are small. So it's really good for tracking, for example, C elegance uh, evolution or samples mounted in a in a normal slide. But for several fish, probably the field of view will be too much reduced. But okay, you can maybe overcome this. So this is the solution we came for. That this was already published with, by Michael and colleagues uh, in 2013, and basically is uh, moving the objective attached to a piezo motor, and in coordination with the light sheet that it's moved uh, using the Galvo mirror. With this, you are able to acquire at 0.8 hertz, and you can have 40 planes in 1.3 seconds with 5 micron uh, resolution. Our system is similar to this, but we take into account other considerations that make it probably more interesting. But uh, just to show you the possibilities in the paper of Michael and colleagues, uh, if you can run the video, please. Here you can see, although the video is a bit down sample, but you can see the whole activity in the, in the animal uh, in 3D, so you can track all the movements of the of the sample. And you can have to see how the, the, the brain is thinking, the brain, the whole brain of the of the zebra fish is thinking. We don't know yet what he was thinking but <laughs> and in that case they were using GCAM uh, five sample. Thank you very much. Uh, recently, there appear other techniques that they, there is no piece movement. It will be everything optically moved. So uh, the light sheet it will move, move, as we were saying before, uh, moving the galvo, the, the position of the galvo. But the focusing of the lens, instead of moving the whole lens, it will be using an optical element place so, uh, and replace. Uh, there are two alternatives. One is tunable lens, and another is the adaptive optics. With tunable lens, you can reach up to 500 frames per second, so you can track any fast um, thing you, you, you want. In that case, this is the, the experimental setup uh, that Hughes can develop in his lab. So the only drawbacks of this uh, tunable lens is that they need to be placed vertically. In that case, it's like this. And it's a bit difficult to synchronize and they all don't allow a really uh, field of view, a big field of view. But they can reach up to 510 uh, frames per second. So there are 30 volume scans per second, and they acquire really nice volumetrical reconstructions of the functioning of the, of the heart of the zebra fish. There are another alternative that is using uh, adaptive optics to expand the, the, field, uh, the depth of field of your image and you can just acquire the claim that uh, 1,600 frames per second. The only problem of that solution is that the image is a bit blurred, so afterwards you need to apply some deconvolution, and then the acquisition is going to be really fast, but the processing may take uh, some time. But it will be ideal for single molecule tracking. So I will just brief uh, show the setup we came for. So. One nice thing of our setup is that it's dedicated to a single application. We just want to see uh, brain and how the brain functions. So uh, it's really well designed and optimized for this application. So we take into account different uh, things. 
The first one is that we only meet uh, the 48 lines, so it's with only one single color. We use a Galvo mirror, actually two, to one to generate the light sheet and the other to shift the, the, fo the focal position. And we have a, a piezo motor that will drive the objective up and down in coordination with the Galvo. We are using CMOS camera, that it has a really large chip, so we are able to acquire the full field of view or of image. And we are using the really shutter mode, that it's a confocal slip, electronic confocal slip, that allow us to acquire really fast and remove some of the background noise of, of the images. We are using a low magnification illumination objective and a high numerical aperture. Uh, so we have light field of view and high resolution and really low noise. And moreover, we make a really compact design that I call it uh, fish pine because it's all mounted in a column and where we are attaching different things. Uh, and for example, one of the things we want to attach next is uh, an ablation mode from here with using a two-photon two -photon light, two-photon microscopy uh, system. Uh, because you know, probably most of you experience that. Uh, space is one of the constraints in any lab. So what we are doing also by making this vertical construction, we are saving a lot of space and our idea is to multiplex this to have several systems running simultaneously for a lot of period of time. Moreover, the sample need to be comfortable. So that's why in this configuration, in the position of the previous one I showed you, the sample is lying in horizontal position and we have control of the temperature and all the, the variables that may affect the, the behavior of the, of the system. And we are developing a system, uh, software that is really useful to, to show. Maybe here you can see the video, yes, to make you uh, an overall vision of, of the system. So we have the illumination arm from this side, and everything is conjugated so you can create your sample that is placed in this chamber here, and everything is computer control in a really easy way. Thank you. So here we have some pictures just to show you the, the device. So we have a laser and then these uh, lenses that they've basically the first galvo that is projected into the second one using a one-one system. Then this galvo is projected to the using lenses into the uh, illumination objective. And here we have different stages for sample positioning and for light sheet positioning. And here we have a state, linear state, just to move all the system and a piezo motor that is not shown in this picture to drive the fast movement of the sample. And this is how the front part of the microscope looks like. So we have this setup of lenses. And we are making a custom-made software in LabVIEW and C++. So here I just want to show you some of the preliminary data we acquired. In that case, you can see a C-Stack with 200 planes. And the frame rate of acquisition, it was 25 frames per second. So we can have really fast acquisition. We are able so far to acquire 40 frames in one second, more or less with the system, uh, let's see if that works. So here you can see how we can travel through all, all, all over the, the, the brain of the, of the zebra fish and collect all this huge amount of data and areas in the brain simultaneously. And in the picture you cannot start the shape, but you can have Really nice resolution of the single cell, so we can uh, segment it and then afterwards tracking to make uh, analysis. In the second video, uh, here you can see this we focus in only one plane, that it was much easier to show you the capabilities of our system. And we were just uh, at the beginning living the natural uh, behavior, spontaneous behavior of the, of the animal. And afterwards, we trigger in the middle of the movie, we have trigger and a stimulus. And you can see how different parts of the brain are uh, really highlighted and the, the signal increase amazingly. This image was also acquired with 25 frames per second, 
we can go a bit faster, but in this case, uh, uh, we prefer to lose a bit of temporal resolution and gain of brighter signals, so it's more for showing purposes. So uh, the video is too slow. Okay. Well, maybe in the, later in the in the presentation of Kevin, you can see it uh, better. Presentation where you can see in that case we are not filtering, so you can see the behavior. It's a bit delayed uh, with the response. In that case, we have the same channel, the response, and the behavior. So just to finish, I will just highlight some of the challenges for the future we have with this technique. And first is just. Uh, create more complex uh, stimulations and to create an environment that is more um, reliable and, and according with the natural environment of the fish. Also another challenge for the future is the development of new transgelling lines and uh, our group is working really hard on, on this and we have new varieties that they are creating faster responses and with a really bright signal. So we will be able to, to, to uh, measure with this uh, light shading conjugation with this new transgenic line to study more complex uh, situation on, on the brain. And it's also needed new methods for data storage and image processing, but this is common to all these light shading microscopy because they are generating huge amount of data. So uh, actually there is a real need to combine different skills in a multidisciplinary teams. So we need biologists, physicists, engineers, and computer science. So this is really exciting world and I encourage you to, to, to enter and to participate in this such a project. Here you have some description of the transgenic lines that are already existing, but in the future this list will be continuously growing. So. And about the data storage, just take into account that only a single data set may occupy around uh, half uh, gigabyte to one gigabyte, depending on the resolution you are having and the bit depth. And if you are acquiring images every 30 seconds or every one minute, you will end up up to half an hour of imaging with one terabyte of information. So that you need to process, analyze, and store. So you need a lot of memory and many process uh, computational power in order to remove noise, analyze, segment it, and correlate different areas. And also there is a need of new uh, ways of representing the, the data. For example, now you can either represent, uh, collect different areas and measure the activity, the overall activity in this area, make correlations between different areas, and create activity maps. But for sure, there will be space for new ways of representing this huge amount and complex data. And uh, in a while, Kevin Fishman will show you how IMARIS can, can do this kind of things and images this part. So sorry for the interruptions. From my side, it's everything uh, done. So I just would like to, to acknowledge all my team here in the UIC, Nuno Moreno, Gabriel Martins, Thiago Valle and Pereira, and my team in CCU, Michael Orger, Claudia, and Jose Lima, and all the collaborators that make possible all the nice pictures I saw you during the presentation. And now, uh, Kevin, if you want to show your uh, nice images, thank you very much to everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Emilio, for the uh, fantastic presentation. Really impressive technology there. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, we, we probably don't have a lot of time to, to go into depth of MRS based on the, the scheduled time for the presentation. I think so perhaps we can schedule a separate session and, and publicize that uh, to look at similar applications in, in a little bit more detail uh, within the software. Okay. But um, with that, I'll, I'll just continue and, and, and give everyone uh, some idea of the workflow. Uh, as Amelia was saying, uh, with this type of data acquisition, the data size management uh, right away becomes a problem, and, and that's something we've been hammering away at for many, many years at BitPlan to uh, improve the ability of MRS to deal with very large data sets, uh, in particular with the most recent 7.7 .7 release, uh, the ability to, to load them extremely fast so that if you 
Uh, if you have even multi-terabyte data sets, I've been talking to some people who are able to see something on screen uh, fairly quickly and then the rest streams in. So the, uh, the possibility of, of quick inspection and interaction even with very large data uh, is, is one of the advantages of going to some other software outside of, of the different uh, free packages that Amelia was talking about that are, are also very good for getting started. Uh, here you see uh, one of those zebrafish brain functional images, uh, calcium uh, expression that uh, Amelia was talking about. I will go ahead and, and have a go at playing it back since he mentioned the, the frame rate was not good. I don't know necessarily if... Um, Adobe will, will be able to broadcast the same frame rate that I'm seeing locally during the desktop sharing. But you see here in the middle uh, that there's a, a huge spike in the, the calcium signal uh, post-stimulus. And, and that's something that obviously would be interesting to measure, uh, maybe in particular looking at different brain regions. In this case, we're looking at a single plane of illumination that, uh, if, if I understand correctly, was, was acquired just as a single plane rather than a stack just to suit uh, faster acquisition time since these are fast events and, and see uh, what sort of time resolution you could get by just imaging a, a single plane here. And so if you were interested in, in getting those kinds of measurements out of such an image, uh, if you only have a calcium signal, the uh, morphology of it is going to vary over time. So an, an automatic detection of anatomical features is, is not really possible because the, the shape will change based on the, the distribution of uh, these calcium waves over time. And in, in that sort of scenario, really what you need to do is some, some manual segmentation in the, in the worst case, as, as we were dealing with here, or modify your experiment so that perhaps uh, if you were interested in measuring signal just within the optic tecta here, you could have uh, just some GFP perhaps that was, was only expressed in that region of the anatomy and have that as a second channel to use for the process of automatic segmentation uh, so there isn't so much manual intervention. Uh, I don't know what the technical possibilities of that are on the biological side, but something along those lines where you have a, a morphological label would make things easier. But if you don't, then you go through the process of drawing contour lines. In this case, on a 2D image, uh, I have just drawn some contours that are now represented by surfaces here and can be used for, for masks for, for measurement. And you see here there are, uh, there's an object-based interface so that you can go through and, and of course, label them with some, some meaningful names and color them with some, some useful colors to, to make sense of the data. But finally, once you have uh, outlined the, the regions that you're interested in, in measuring differently, uh, the most basic sort of thing to do would be to go in and, and look at intensity fluctuations in each region. Uh, so I put together something similar to one of the, the figures that Emilio was showing in this uh, vantage view, as we call it in MRS, uh, so that you can show the variation in intensity in each region over time. And at the moment here, it's, it's rendering the actual surfaces, which could be interesting, except they're, they're just tiny, tiny little shapes. So it is possible to, to render the objects in their natural shape within a plot in this vantage view, which can be interesting, uh, but in this case, uh, not particularly useful for the, the density of the time points. So. The process here is to just go through and select the input data, which I've already done, and, and select the axes. Uh, and here I'm going to uh, turn off the, the visibility of the object so that we can see the lines a little bit more clearly. And for my color selection, basically the warm colors are, are representing the right side and, and the cooler colors the left side to try to uh, differentiate things a little bit. And then you have the possibility to, to show some, for instance, uh, box and whisker plots, though it doesn't necessarily make sense to show that for the time axis so we can hide that. And then finally, uh, the axes are, are a bit reversed here, so we need to shift the position of the, the origin for this to make a bit more sense if we're looking at a, a time intensity plot.
And so now the, the low values are, are at the left and so on. And we have these nice plots showing the trends. And of course, this summary data can be exported in addition to the, uh, the individual data points. But it's, it's, a, it's a nice way to be able to go in and explore. And if, if you have this plot, these are, these are active data objects that you can interact with. And so if you click on an object in the plot here, you can switch back to the 2D or 3D image view and have that object from the plot highlighted and, and, and get some specific measurements for that. So the, the idea is to have a very interactive interface in MRS and to make it possible for, for fairly smooth interactions as we go forward with larger and larger data sets. Uh, moving beyond uh, just 2D space and um, simple intensity measurements, you also have the possibility to uh, work in 3D. And here we see another example of more or less the, the same data, but the, the time resolution is not quite as good. And, and you have here as well some, some point data that's been detected. So if we, if we wanted to do something along the lines of counting cells uh, or, or any kind of point or blob with a very high signal compared to the background, uh, we could use these spots objects, but a, a rectangular ROI is not sufficient for the specific anatomy. And so you can use these contours not just to measure the intensity, but to modify where you're searching for other types of objects, such as spots and, and filaments and uh, cells and so on. Uh, and so then finally, you have two different groups of spots here, uh, each one from a specific brain region. And you could look at the, the number of cells that are lighting up in each region uh, over time. Uh, and, and do a little bit different sort of analysis based on count. You could also look at the location of these objects in 3D space and, and see if there's any trends uh, towards clustering. So what is the distance to the nearest neighbor of each one over time and that type of analysis. We don't really have time, unfortunately, to go into all of the details, but maybe we'll do another follow-up session. The other thing that's interesting with the masks is that um, if you would prefer to do some visualization of a specific region and you only have a single channel as we do in this case, you can use them just as, as visualization masks as well. And what I mean by that is that even though there's only one channel in the data set, I can now have a volume rendering or slice rendering of specific brain regions as well as color them in different ways as if it was a, a multi-channel data set for, for purposes of illustration and, and uh, creating figures and so on. And I think that's probably all we have time for because we were hoping to, um, to get some questions in as well. And, and I sincerely hope we'll have another session that we can notify everyone of to, to go into a little bit more detail if anyone is interested. So uh, thanks again to Emilio and, and to Elsevier. And I think we'll move on to the, the Q&A portion to try to get a few questions in while everyone's still here. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Emilio and Kevin, for your presentation. Um, I see that there have been actually quite a lot of questions that have come in, and I would like to start with the first one. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible to reconstruct a tiny tissue cell structure in a single cell resolution? And also, is it possible to pick as many single cells as possible on each layer? Uh, sorry, sorry, I have an interruption here. Can you repeat, please? Of course. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. The question is, is it possible to reconstruct a tiny tissue cell structure in the single cell resolution? Um, and is, it, is it also possible to pick as many single cells as possible on each layer? And with light sheets, well, it depends. Uh, for example, in the experiment we are doing with the, the uh, cell steroids, we are able to detect single cells. The problem is in, in the, the matter they are organized, or for example in the case of the um, ganglion cells, the superficial cells are really well reconstructed. The problem is to, when you try to go into the, into the sample, if it's really thick and really opaque, then you have problems to, to, to reconstruct your, your data sets and, and to get information. But in principle, uh, the difficult part in tissue cell culture, uh, well, in cell culturing, is how to mount your sample for light sheet. Because, for example, if it's something three-dimensional, it's much easier to embed it inside the agar. If we try it already with our system uh, in cover slides, and it could work, but we have to change all the configuration of the setup. It's not easy to work. 
for that case, I will recommend if they are interested in in tissue culturing in in cover slides to use an approach like the die spin that is like the 45 degrees illumination. You have a normal microscope stage and then uh, two lenses coming in 45 degrees angle. That would be much easier to operate and to work with. I don't know if I answered the question. Well, thank you very much, Emilio. Um, the next question is, um, do you only scan in water? Yeah, most of the time we have the, everything embedded in water uh, because the, we do need to mount the sample in agarose. So you need to have the chamber around with, with water. So the, there are different mounting systems. There is uh, Agaros, now the, there is another one that is Fitagel, that is even more transparent, but the problem is get more rigid, so sometimes your sample, if it's for developmental approaches, could be too rigid. If it's for a fixed sample, it's okay, and it's even more transparent than Agaros. And also you can use some uh, FAP tubes, uh, some polymers that they have the same refractive in index than water, but all this has to be embedded in, in water. You can also use it, uh, I make a couple of experience with the ants, for example, just without using water. But uh, the best results usually are when, when the sample is embedded in water, because the, the collection objective, uh, the ones we have and the one that everybody uses is uh, uh, deep water deep in objectives, but they have high numerical aperture, really good resolution, and big field of view because they have low magnification, and they are working inside uh, water chambers. But of course, you can do it in air. Thank you very much. Um, the, next, the next question is, how quickly can you collect the images? Because you would have to do Z scans for every rotational position. Yes. In my case, my system is a bit slow, but just for some constraints, the motor I have, it's a bit slow. But I can acquire normally three images per second, three to four, depending on if I crop the image. But it's just a matter because the files are four megabytes and the transfer to the computer, it's a bit, the pipeline is not optimized. But uh, you normally when you're scanning your sample through the light sheet, you can get these four, maximum five frames per second. And then depending on your sample, a typical sample of, uh, I think in 30 seconds to scan more or less uh, one of these asteroids, then 30 seconds for every view. So it depends uh, the, the type of uh, process, if you want to make a time lapse of a, uh, evolutionary process. We try with Zebrafish. Zebrafish is working really nice because it's evolving really slowly. But when you are trying to track in, in Drosophila embryos, then you are a bit limited because acquiring several views, usually you can, with four views, it's enough to make the reconstruction, four to five. And then sometimes you may lose some some features because the sample is moving inside the the embryo really, really fast. But for several fish, it's performing fantastic, and other samples, like the ball box I showed during the presentation, that, that slow evolution is really good system. Thank you very much. Um, one of our listeners would like to know if it is possible to see the division process of a single cell. Yeah, it is possible, and actually uh, there are many groups reporting. There is one really nice paper in, in cell steroids, where they are able to track the, the cell division uh, of a cell steroid, uh, of cancer cell steroid, and with a system really similar to, to the one we have, you are able to, to see cell division, and basically SPIN is able to, to go to this really frame, fast frame rate, the only thing you have to have the, the proper system. I mean, for example, uh, the only what I was commenting before is your cells are mounted in a cover slide, in a cover slip. It's really difficult to, to mount it for this kind of system, not the one I show here. But you can make light sheet in another different configuration and track really fast processes on not only cell division but many others. Thank you very much. One of our listeners would like to know, how do you make the light sheet? Um, and she um, says, what is your optical unit? My optical unit, I'm using, I have two ways, with the cylindrical lens, 
or uh, uh, but my preferred one is with the light uh, with the galvo mirror so i have one galvo that's controlled by the arduino board and that is acting like basically like a digital to analog converter and it's just applying a voltage and just sweeping the the light up and down really fast like in the discotheque <laughs> so you can just move uh, the light and create the, the shape you want so basically we are creating um, a plane of light and we can use uh, two photon excitation or uh, normal uh, laser excitation thank you very very much you're welcome um so one of our listeners would like to know how sensitive is the system compared to confocal and are functioning imaging applications like FLIM, frequency domain, and option? Uh, compared with confocal, uh, we have made some comparisons and uh, we realized that our system, uh, like in microscopy, uh, it's a bit, um, the penetration, it's a bit uh, higher than in confocal systems. The comparison is a bit not easy uh, because the, the the whole philosophy of the system is, uh, is really different. But yes, in order to compare, it will be more fair to compare it with uh, a spinning confocal. But it's also based in camera systems because uh, normal confocal is scanning um, the a beam through the sample and it's quite slow compared with light sheet. Compared with the spinning disk, uh, we have uh, several images in asteroids, and we just realized that we are able to obtain same quality in, in resolution, and we are increasing a little bit the, the penetration depth. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all the questions that we have time for today. Um, thank you very, very much for your participation and You're also welcome. for submitting some excellent questions. Um, we apologize again for the technical uh, difficulties that we have been facing through this presentation, but I hope it has been very relevant to all of you. Um, any questions that we were unable to answer uh, today will be passed on to the speakers who will then try to answer your questions later on. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers for their presentations and also the attendees of today's seminar. Uh, this has been a very informative webinar with a lot of thoughtful questions and answers. Please don't forget that there will be a recording of this webinar that is also available online very, very shortly. This webinar has been part of the When Size Matters series from Bitplane. Um, further information can be found at bitplane.com slash sumo. That is bitplane, P-L-A-N-E, dot com slash S-U-M-O. You can also follow and join in the conversation on Twitter and Facebook by using the hashtag When Size Matters. The following webinars in the series are also coming up. There are two for tissue clearing techniques. Um, one is called Clarity by Dr. Viviana Gradinaru. That will be sometime in mid-November. Uh, the second one is TED as a clearing agent by Dr. Trevor Wardill at the end of October or November. Um, there is a webinar on microscopy techniques, uh, SPIM, Single Plane Illumination Microscopy System for Visualizing Very Large Samples by Dr. Julian Colombelli in November. And the last one, combining histology and tissue visualization techniques, uh, a mesoscale connectome of the, of the mouse brain by Tim Reagan, the CEO of Tissue Vision, in December. I hope you have enjoyed our webinar today. Thank you very much, everybody, and hope you have a very good day.